So last time we, we said that for different uh, distribution, you could have different shape. You could have Gaussian for the rate distribution function if it's a summation of a random event, or you could end up with a uniform distribution if those events have equal chance to come, all right? <laughs> like this is a fair die, basically throwing a fair die, right? And out of that small f, you can come up with the capital F, the cumulative distribution. It's the addition of all the small f up to the point where you're trying to get this function, right? So obviously the first one, the small f, the first capital F is also the same as the small f. But the second capital F is adding those two small f. And the third one is adding all of them up to this point. And eventually the, the maximum, which is state 12, what is the capital F for it? It's one, because it's adding all those fractions, right? And we said basically that we jumped, we finished, this was the last thing that we talked about last time. And we said that one of those famous distribution, <coughs> this is not the only distribution, but one of the famous one is the Gaussian distribution, or what they call normal distribution. Okay, because that's normally what you get if the if you have a process that's summation of random events, right? And we said it's symmetric, and that is that how it look like. And so the that function that I plotted over here, how did I plot that curve? I need to plot that curve. I need two things. I need mu and sigma. I need the mean and the standard deviation, right? I mean, look at the equation. The equation is function of x, okay? Yes, because that's the x-axis. But how do you plot it? You need any any other number there. By, of course, you know by. But you need that sigma that show up twice and that mu. If you have the mu and the sigma, you can plot the curve. <coughs> All right? So, how did I get the mu and the sigma? Out of the problem one, when we said, here is the data, give me the mu and the sigma. So that mu that we calculated, the 1.04, and that sigma that we calculated, the 36 or something, I put those in the equation, and then I could actually plot this using Excel. I tell them here is the equation, and now for different x's, 10, 20, 30, all the way to 180, give me the, give me the f of x. And you would use this equation, and you would plot this, right? The only trick is, what is the area under the curve? One. one. Excellent. The area under this curve is one. But the area under the bar chart is not one. <coughs> if you add all the f value from the, from the bar chart, you get one. But the area is not just the height. The area is the height multiplied by the width. So, it's not the same area. So actually, this guy is plotted on that scale, and this guy is plotted on another scale that's not shown here. But it's it's twice as, or basically, the difference between them is, uh, is the power widths. So that then they have the same area. All right? Anyway, so this is how you can plot the, the Gaussian. All right? And so, because this guy is important, huh, we, we have to study a little bit more about it. How does it look like? Of course, you know that the, the capital F of something like this would be up till here, you know, you are adding, uh, and then you keep adding, and so by the end you reach the max, the capital F should end up being 1, right? The capital F should start from 0 and finish at 1. And at the average, at the average, huh? of the Gaussian, <coughs> capital F will also be, for a free homework problem, one. no, <coughs> at the average Zero. of, no, capital F should be, one half, half. One half. who said that? Yeah. You get free homework problem. Remember to put it in the Excel at the end of the class. Why point half? Point half, that's actually, huh? That That's basically the, not really the, the average in when it comes to the to the capital F. That's basically half the population, all right? So the average doesn't have to be exactly the, the in the middle, all right? So, but because of the symmetry of the curve, you get basically capital F 0.5 exactly at the average, all right? 
So here, this is basically integrating all the small f, you will end up with this capital F. That's how that took like, right? That curve is basically described by this equation. And, and because it's important, because again, it happened so many times, they actually put it in, in a table, right? But they cannot put it in a table for all mu and sigma. So they basically pick the standard normal distribution where mu is zero, and sigma is 1, okay? And that become the standard normal distribution, capital V of Z, right? So if you look, compare this to this, you will see that it's exactly the same, except that sigma is not there because it's 1, and you don't have basically minus mu. The mu is 0. The fact that this is <coughs> dV and this is du, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's the argument that you are integrating over, right? Whether it's d lambda dk, they, they, it will go away in the in the integration, and all you will get is basically the two units or the two limits of the integration, the minus infinity over here, and the the z where you are trying to come up with the, f, the capital F at. Shane, you had a question. Yeah, what's that? Um, the v up in the first one. So so that? let's let's go here. So it should be function of x, right? F of x, correct? This is the small f of x. It's function of x. X is x axis. And that's how it looks like. Capital F, the commutative distribution, is also function of x. How do we get it? We integrate this guy. We integrate it from minus infinity all the way to the x where you would like to get the capital F of x at, right? So we are integrating this, and the, the limits of the integration is from minus infinity to x. So it would be confusing if you have x at the limit and x inside the integration. So they basically decided to call the argument, huh, the variable that we're integrating over, v. Let's call it k. Let's call it m. It doesn't matter. They just basically switched all the x over here and the dx into v and v. Right? Because eventually they want to substitute between minus infinity and x. What I'm trying to say is the integration from minus infinity to x e of minus u squared du is the same as minus infinity to x e to minus lambda squared d lambda. Right? Shane, right? Okay. Doesn't really matter, right? No. But this is much easier to understand or it's easier for, for us to understand than this. Because there are just too many x's, and now you are like lost. What is, uh, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Huh? So he's basically trying to get this x out of your front of your eye, so that you would see that you are integrating. And once you integrate, you will substitute this and this, and the number that you'll get is function of x. Right. The negative infinity term is that just the like? So that y minus infinity, because that that distribution, huh, that Gaussian. Mm -hmm. It really go to zero, theoretically speaking, at infinity. He will actually go to zero, 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 one pretty quickly. But in order to go really to zero, you have to go to infinity. So that's why capital F is adding everything that's the, all the small f up to the point. So there are actually small f, theoretically speaking, all the way up to minus infinity. All the way to minus infinity, there are small f. They are so tiny, but they are there. So, All right? But we go from negative infinity to x. Right. Yes, because there are numbers from minus infinity all the way to x. x the x is uh, one or the two or the three, whatever the function, the whatever the number that you would like to get the capital F at. All right? So. Now, with even every making mu and uh, sigma, making sigma 1 and making mu 0, so that would be not an any Gaussian. That's a Gaussian sitting at the origin, all right? Or basically, you should think about it as basically Gaussian centered on your mean, whatever your mean is. Huh? The GBE of the students, where is it? The average 3.5. That would be sitting at 3.5. Your 3.5 is the new 0 now, all right? Very good. So here are table S7 is basically this, right? This function. 
So I just want you to warn, warn you of something. See, all those numbers, we know capital F should start from zero and should finish at one. So what is this 9,965? Look at this. It's because there is a zero over here. He's trying to say that all those things are 0 0.994, 0 0.9965. So those zeros over here huh, is basically applied to all those numbers. So what is the capital fee at when Z is 2.66? It's 0 0.9. 0.9961 okay and why they are not starting from zero because he's made starting from here huh? because of the symmetry kind of he's basically starting from here right so when z is zero it starts supposed to start at 0.5 actually not from one so 0.5 all the way to the Right? Again, the, the, when capital F is 0.5, you are basically getting the median, the median of the data. Right? And the mean, why the median is not always the mean? Well, for Gaussian it is, but I would like you to imagine a distribution like, like this. You know, we said that a lot of application in engineering is log normal. So the median will be something like this, half the population is here and the other half over here, and the mean will tend to... The mean, tend to the, the mean will tend to go this way, why? Because those guys, huh? they have bigger value. Their x is really huge, and even if there is not that many of them to pull the median toward them, but just having, you know, one, if we have Bill Gates here in, in, the, in Tulsa living with us, the average of our income will immediately go higher. But the median will still not really move that much. So half the population will still be this much and the other half will be that much. It's just that because of the long tail, you will move the, the mean toward them. I mean, remember the formula. The formula is XF. So even with a small f at this side, with a big x, it will matter more than the same f on the smaller side. Okay? Does this make sense? All right. So again, out of those data, then they figured very important things about the Gaussian distribution. And that is, the data is actually 68% of the data is busy, or that's like two-thirds, 68, that's two-thirds. Two-thirds of the data is between sigma plus sigma and minus sigma around the average. <coughs> All right? And when you go to two sigma and two sigma on this side, you get 95.5% of the data. And when you go to three sigma this way and three sigma that way, you get 99.7%. So basically, within six sigma, three here and three there around the average, 99.7. That's kind of almost all your population is sitting between three sigma this way and three sigma that way. You are leaving only the, the very random or like, not very random, but very, very uh, rare events that happen outside those six sigma. Assuming it's Gaussian distribution. Okay? So we will we'll use this in the next chapter as well. So just remember that how the kind of the, the chances of having those events deteriorate really, really quickly once you go outside three sigma. This way and three sigma that way. Yes? So when you hear six sigma, that's three sigmas in each direction, not six sigmas forward? I don't know. It depends on what they want. I don't know. <coughs> but mathematically, this is what's going on. Within six sigma, three here and three there, you get 99.7 .7 of all events will happen within that range. All right? Of course, if you want to bet your life on something, uh, you don't bet on six sigma. You, s you bet on infinity and infinity. I mean, if you go to infinity and infinity, then you will get all the chances. Yeah, 0.3% chance. All right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Okay.
So now let's uh, let's do the last problem and also actually let's review quickly what we said about the probability. Especially two equations that we discussed last time. And that was basically this. So l l let's we made a distinction last time between when the two events are independent events or basically when one event, the second event, will depend on the first one happening or not. So when they are basically independent from each other, the probability of having A and B, A intersect B, A will happen and then B will happen. But again, A and B are completely independent from each other. All right? The, it's the probability of that thing happening is A multiplied by probability of B. All right? And when, when they actually depend on each other or the probability of having something like this, that when for B to happen, A also need to happen first. It's what it was this B, probability of A, and then multiply probability of B, condition that A already happened. And we had this example when he was picking two screws, and we said, what is the chance of out of ten screws? There were three bad. And we said, what's the probability of pulling two of them, one after the other, that were actually post-correct? So the first, if we replace, after we find out here, it's correct, let's put back again. Then the second event now has nothing to do with the first event. The fact that the first event had false or bad, I mean good or bad screw, is in no way affecting the second event. That let's pull one more and see what's going on. Right? So that's why the probability is A times the probability of B. And for both events, the probability is there are three bad and seven good. So the chance of me pulling a good one is seven out of ten. And the second time, it's again seven out of ten. Right? But when he put the screw, he, he pulled the screw and he keep it with his hand and say, now pull another one. Let's, let's see the chances of having two screws that are correct. Now, the second event actually is related to the first event. The fact that you pulled one out of the box and you didn't replace it, now I'm having different population. I'm pulling from it. You changed my, whether you go right or wrong, whether that was defective or not, that will affect the second event. All right? And so that's why it was basically BA multiplied by probability of B conditioning A. The probability of A, one of them is correct, still 0.7. The probability of B conditioning that A already happened, that means that you are trying to pull a correct one, a good one, even with the fact that you already pulled a good one previously. So th that makes the population now not 10 with 3 defective, now it's actually 9 with 3 defective. Right? That's different population. And so then it becomes that chance of getting a correct one is 6 out of 9. It's 2 over 3. So 7 over 10 multiplied by 2 over 3. Okay, so now let's look at the homework problem. So the homework problem said that there is a manufacturer and he basically inspect the, the product before they ship them using two guys, right? Two trust inspectors. Over several years, huh? those two inspectors working independently from each other, one of them basically is 0.05% probability of uh, finding a defective case. Sorry, this is the probability of a defective case getting by the first inspector. So that's the chance of him failing. 5%. Alright? And the probability of the second guy, he's not really careful. And he tends to overlook stuff. So things can slip by him very easily. And it's 10% that he would fail. And see how the two events, the first guy picking a case and the second guy picking a case, they are not related to each other. Every one of them work by itself. Huh? When he bought, when the first guy see the box and said it's okay, he doesn't tell the second guy it's okay, let it go. No, the second guy go and, and look again, trying to figure is it okay or not. So the two events are completely independent from each other, right? So what is the probability that a defective case gets by both inspectors? 
So A need to happen and also B need to happen and they are not related to each other. So what should I do? Multiply, exactly. All we have to do is just multiply. Yeah, when I read that homework problem, uh, this, so is this a trick question? <laughs> no, it's here? just a nice professor. Is there an invisible <laughs> ink? <laughs> so, it's the probability of A intersect B. A and B need to happen, and because they are independent from each other, because they check the case independently, it's 0.05 multiplied by 0.1. So basically, that is the chance that we will ship something bad out of this place. Right? It's less than 1%. It's 0.5% chance. Right? Very good. So, I think now I'll give you uh, 10 minutes for your quiz. And then we'll have 10 minutes break. And then after that, we can actually have our class at uh, 35. Quiz first and then the break. Quiz first and then the break, correct. <laughs>